So this is now the sixth Sunday in which we have been reflecting upon the theme of God's grace, which we've defined as the unmerited, undeserved, unearnable favor of God, which, like the sun, shines upon the just and the unjust alike. And we've walked through a variety of images as we've looked at that grace. We, we looked at the image of an unmerited welcome as we saw the children being welcomed to Jesus when the, the apostles were trying to reject them. We looked at the unmerited pardon of God as we saw the way Jesus pardoned with mercy a woman who was caught in the midst of adultery. We talked about the citizenship that God offers us and especially offers to those who feel like they don't belong to any land or people. We talked about membership, unmerited membership in the body of Christ by which we are included into the very person of God in the body of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. And we talked last week about being undeservedly adopted into God's family, made members of God's family, beloved children of God. Each of those images, an increasing level of intimacy, inviting us to go deeper with God. And today, we look at unmerited inheritance, the inheritance that is ours as beloved sons and daughters of God. Now, over the course of these six weeks, as we've been looking at these different images of grace, in part, what we find in Paul and in Jesus is this, this continuous banging away at the minds and hearts of people with different metaphors, hoping that one of them will grab you where you are and help you get just how incredibly Gracious and abundant is God's love for you. So if you were someone who was unwelcomed and not allowed access, as many were, to the temple, God's welcome would be a word of grace to you. If you were in that time someone who believed that your sin was so terrible that it could never be pardoned, that as Jesus spoke to this woman, you too might hear that your sin is pardonable and in fact has already been forgiven. For the many, many people who wandered without citizenship in the Roman Empire and any access to the benefits of that, Paul declares that you can be citizens in an even bigger realm, an even more important realm, the realm of God. And you can be granted full and complete citizenship in that realm. For those who felt disconnected from God, disconnected from the holy, Paul says, you, you can be members of the very body of Christ. God will dwell in you, and you will dwell in God. And to those who were orphaned and without family, Paul said, you, are my brothers and sisters because God has made you familia with me. Today is the last image that we'll look at in this reflection on grace, but it's by far not the last image of grace present in Scripture. It's just the last one that I've chosen, that we are granted an inheritance and that we, like all those who may feel disinherited, cut out of the inheritance, can receive the gift of inheritance through Christ, of life, life that is enduring, life that will not end. Now, inheritance is an interesting theme because, um, you know, as a pastor, I'm kind of privy to the death experience for families in a way that not all of us have the opportunity to be. And 
part of what happens with the death experience is the inheritance issue. Because as people die, then their wills, or lack thereof, come into play. And unfortunately, I've watched family upon family that were relatively integrated and together be completely ripped apart over issues of inheritance. Because some people get and some people don't get. And that same reality was certainly true in Paul's day and in Jesus' time. The rules of inheritance, though, in those days were different from the ones that we understand uh, today to be true. For example, by law, in Jewish families, all inheritance passed from the father to the sons. But it was not distributed equally. The firstborn son, even if he was not the favorite of the father, was to get a double portion of whatever the father's wealth was. And the rest of the sons could divide up the rest equally. But the firstborn son always got twice as much as anybody else did. So that didn't feel very fair, I'm sure, to quite a few brothers. But the sisters got nothing at all. <coughs> nothing. Unless there were no brothers or other male relatives that were able to inherit, which was not very often the case. So women rarely inherited anything at all. So they were certainly among the disinherited of that day. And wives, just so you know, you could never inherit anything from your husbands, period. But husbands would inherit everything of yours. <laughs> That's fair, right? Isn't it interesting how different times and different people think different things are fair or equitable? Well, as you can imagine, there were lots and lots of people who were disinherited, who did not feel very happy about the way the inheritance thing would work out in that time. And so Paul picks up this theme of inheritance, which has got to be a theme that's got a lot of prickly, you know, kind of nerve endings around it for lots of people. And he unpacks it in a way that is so incredibly generous and abundant that it's almost hard for us to grasp what a break it is from the experience of people in that time. Let's just look at some of the contrasts between human inheritance and God's inheritance. So the first is, that it is only the firstborn who receives this double portion. Everybody else gets lots less, right? Everybody else gets lots less. And yet Paul articulates in his letters that Jesus, the firstborn of all creation, right? Jesus, who is the firstborn son, gives to us everything that he has access to, to, access to as well. That instead of keeping anything uniquely for himself, the firstborn son of God gives it out freely to his apostles, to his followers, to the church in the Holy Spirit. We get to participate equally in the inheritance of Jesus' life, of Jesus' power, of God's spirit. All the things granted to him have been also granted equally to us. You see, human inheritance laws, this is the second contrast, are based on an idea of limited wealth. There's only this much, and so you got to split it up, and not everybody can have everything, because when you start to spread the inheritance around, it has to be divided into parts. When we were in Chuisach Kaba, small community, Mayan community in Guatemala, we were talking one day with, these are uh, coffee farmers, small coffee farmers, and we were talking about the next generation because these men were very anxious about what would happen to the next generation. 
And in fact, many of their children were fleeing the community and going into the big city to try and make a living. Because, see, the fathers had a plot of land that was this big, and it was barely able to produce enough income for the family. And they wondered, what's going to happen when my six sons get one-sixth of what I now can't support my family on very well? How in the world are they going to survive? Limited resource. And you divide it too many times, and it doesn't provide enough for anyone. <coughs> By contrast, the idea that Paul presents is that inheritance, when it is shared, is not divided, but multiplied. The, the everlasting life that God offers us, the inheritance of life that God gives us in Jesus Christ, is not diminished when it's shared. It's expanded. It, it multiplies. It grows as it's shared. It's not diminished and reduced in any way. We think scarcity. God wants abundance. And then there is the issue of all those who get left out, disinherited by our human system and structure. <laughs> we only can manage to give to certain ones, but not to all, because we don't think there's enough or because truly we have favorites and we bless them more richly than we bless our others. But you see, Jesus' experience of belovedness, of being beloved child of God, that he, that he intuited, that he grasped at his baptism, is the exact same belovedness that we confer upon one another in his name at this baptismal pond. You and I are also equally beloved sons and daughters of God. There is no distinction in belovedness. Jesus wants every one of us to experience that same level of specialness with God that he did. Again, all of us are welcomed into this experience rather than it being, well, I'm the chosen one, you know, so y'all can just move along. In our study with, uh, the, uh, with the new members, we're looking at our confessions, and one of the doctrines of our Reformed tradition that is particularly important to me is the idea that our election, our chosenness, is for service and salvation. Not so we can claim specialness on our own, but so we can use that gift of understanding how special we are to God to help others understand how special they are to God. That's why we have it. It's why Jesus got it. So we could also extend that to one another, just like he did. Now, Jesus did not have many possessions to pass along as an inheritance to anyone. He had no kids. He had no land. He had no property. He had no home. In fact, he said one time, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but I don't even have a place to put my head down. So what is it that he did give? What is the inheritance that's ours? Perhaps we find a clue in his conversation with the woman from Samaria at the well who asked for living water so she would not thirst anymore. And Jesus said, yes, I will give you water that will run forever within you so that you will never thirst again. Living water, water of life. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. 
the gift that Jesus wants to give you and me, the inheritance that he wants to hand over to each and every one of us in full portion is the gift of life. Life that does not end. And not just when we die, but right now. Right now. Life that does not end, in which you and I can participate right now. Jesus told a story about inheritance, which most of us have heard before. A story we call the story of the prodigal son. And it's an interesting story because it's about the younger son who would have received a less than portion, right, than his older brother, who gets crosswise with his dad for reasons we don't really know, and basically says to his dad, I wish you would just die. And if you're not going to die, then will you just give me what's coming to me so I can get out of here? Now, that was not exactly the most affirming way to have talked to your father, not then or now. But back then, it was particularly dishonoring of a father to speak like that. But disregarding the dishonor, the father says, here you go. It's yours. You don't have to wait for death in order to get it. You can have it now. And so he takes that gift of inheritance. But instead of using it wisely, he squanders it. He spends it in ridiculous, self-indulgent ways and ends up with nothing. Believing one day that his only hope is to go back as a slave in his father's house and hope that he could eat with the other slaves rather than starve to death. So he comes back to his father, who has been waiting for him every single day. Not waiting to beat his head with a baseball bat, like he probably deserved, but waiting to embrace him. And so much to the son's surprise when he comes back to the father who had given him his inheritance, who owed him nothing more in life or in death, expecting nothing but punishment. And what does the father do? There is more to give. <laughs> he grabs him embraces him, puts his coat around him, puts his ring on his finger, and kills the best cow to throw him a celebration. Abundance. 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 And as I thought about inheritance and in that story, I thought, isn't it just true that God gives us life. And what do we do? <laughs> Too often, we squander the gift. And if we come back, recognizing our foolish and stupid ways, we come back often fearing Afraid of God. Afraid of getting what we really deserve. But the God who gave us this inheritance of life only has more life and love to give. And gathers us in and says, you are still my child. I have never forgotten you. And I have more to give you now. That, that is the kind of inheritance that Jesus gives to us. So, 
to wrap this whole reflection of grace up. Part of what I have tried to do is to say to you and to me, whatever woundedness you bring to this moment, whether it's feeling unwelcomed and pushed aside, whether it's feeling guilty and full of sin, whether it's feeling like you have no place to belong, whether it's feeling like you are so distant from God, you and God could never be one, whether it's feeling alone and without a family, whether it's feeling disinherited in whatever way that has happened to you. God meets you with grace at that place of woundedness and says, all that I am, all that I have is yours. Today, tomorrow, and even when you die. That, that is amazing grace. And I hope it sounds as sweet to you as it does to me. Let's pray. Amoros Dios. Gracias por un amor tan abundante tan gracioso que no tiene límites que no tiene fin y que siempre se dispone a nuestra necesidad ayúdanos ayúdanos te pido con todo mi corazón para recibir la herencia nuestra con brazos abiertos, corazones alegres. Por Cristo te lo pido.